Hello. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for uh, joining us for uh, our webinar on River Surveyor Live uh, version 4.0. Uh, my name is Isaac Jones. I'm a product manager here at Sontec, and I'm joined today by Daniel Wagner. He's our um, application engineer and senior hydrologist. Uh, good morning, and, and thank you, Isaac. Uh, looking definitely forward to some of the discussions we about uh, river survey development that we've done the co last couple of months. Okay, so um, today here's a here's a quick overview of what we're going to go over. We're going to present for about 30 minutes, and then um, take any questions for about 15 minutes, uh, maybe a little longer, depending on how many we have. Okay, so we're going to start off by going over the two of the what we think are the key improvements in River Surveyor Live and River Surveyor Stationary uh, 4.0. So we've added a real-time QAQC quality control um, display. So we're going to talk about that a little bit. And then we're going to talk about uh, this, a significant improvement to the River Surveyor Stationary Live, where we now um, have the option to use GPS for their, your station position and then also your, your distance between stations. Uh, second half, we're going to go over the other improvements to the River Surveyor Live software. So we have some improvements for data management, um, system configuration, a, a manual system configuration, uh, some improvements to the moving bed utilities, uh, MATLAB export improvement, and some post-processing um, improvements to talk about. Uh, at the end, uh, we'll take questions and we'll answer as many questions as we have time for. Uh, if you have a question during the, the presentation, feel free to please uh, submit it via the chat feature and in the go to uh, webinar window. Uh, we may try and answer some as we go if they're relevant and we get them um, in time. Uh, otherwise, we'll try and answer most of the questions at the end. We probably won't have time for all to answer all questions, but don't worry, we'll uh, send a follow-up email that has the questions from the webinar with our answers. So look for a follow-up email if your question didn't get answered. And we'll also take any questions via email. Um, after the, the webinar. Okay, so um, now we'll we'll talk about uh, this this new feature that we're really excited about. Something we wanted to add for a while, and customers have really asked for. We've added a real time quality control uh, monitor in River Surveyor Live. So the the collection of accurate and reliable data set. Uh, as, you, as most of you are aware of, is that it's dependent on uh, sound um, measurement principles as well as uh, operational procedures. Um, the reason why we decided at Sontech to implement the quality control system in the reverse survey life is to give the user that ability to do a performance assessment on the, on the data itself during a measurement. Um, a lot of organizations have either uh, a check sheet that they use at the end uh, to quantify uh, the measurement quality. Um, there's organizations that develop um, sophisticated uh, software, MATLAB software, to analyze and further processing um, the measurement itself. But all those applications are dependent on one single thing, and that is a good uh, data set that was collected. And so for this reason, we decided to implement a system that can analyze the data as it's collected in real time to give the user feedback. Um, there was a number of areas that we focused on um, in this process, as you can see in this framework. Uh, site conditions, and although I'm not going to go into an, an significant detail of each of those, they are well documented in various um, operational manuals as well as ISO uh, standards. So site conditions is definitely an aspect that it does affect uh, your measurement accuracy and data collection, um, same, similar to measurement conditions. Um, system performance is analyzed to see you know, how does the system perform and is it within the, the, the capability of the, of the instrument itself. Um, operator, and we will see, have a slight discussion about it later on, you know, each operator does perform a measurement slightly differently. Even if every single person is using the same principles and the same standard procedures, you will see noticeable differences in the measurements and how those uh, 
methodologies are interpreted by each user. Um, so this entire process gives you the ability to quantify the measurement results in real time. You can make a decision on the fly if you need to restart the transect, if you need to select another site. You can make a decision to determine if the data that you are collecting is of suitable quality. Because it is important to analyze the data itself during the measurement. Um, I don't think, and that's you know, from our perspective, that you know you shouldn't perform that process when you completed the measurement or when you sit at the office. You should start that process immediately when you press the start button on the rest of your life. Because it is a continuous process, Isaac, um, as we all know, that you know need to evaluate that on a continuous basis. Okay, and um, so what we've basically tried to do is incorporate some some quality control checks, some some messages that come up that uh, a, a very experienced user already knows to look for and knows ways to set up the, the data display to, to look for these things that could indicate a problem with your site, um, a problem with the, the instrument, or, or something else that could affect your data quality. So feedback over the years from different customers, plus the, the standard operating procedures and regulations that Daniel mentioned, um, guided us in, in creating feedback for the user. So we have four main categories. So we have uh, error reporting. So this would be something that, that could very well be affecting your data significantly, so, so much so that you might want to change your site. So an example of this is um, we have the on the right-hand side here, we, we're showing what the actual uh, QA, QC messages that come up during the measurement. So in red, we have an error. So there's nine consecutive samples with bad bottom track. Uh, this charge will be biased low. So the user knows that there could be a problem with bottom track, so maybe they need to switch their uh, track reference or possibly move to a different site. The next category is warning. So these are kind of just uh, for your information. And if you have one off here and there, it might not be a problem. So the example here shown in the bubble, uh, number eight magnetic error is greater than 3.5. So the number eight means sample number eight. Um, we're getting this warning message that your magnetic uh, influence from the surrounding area has increased past the threshold. So if this popped up and then you don't see it again, this might not be a problem. But if you're continually getting these warning messages, it's an indication that you uh, have influence on your compass that might affect your, your measurement. Next, we have a counter. Uh, the counter shows how many samples have been affected uh, by a certain error or, 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 um, or flagged with a certain error or warning. So for example, here on the, the right-hand side, we show 40 samples use substituted depth reference. So, for example, this cut, this um, user maybe has selected vertical beam for depth reference, but the vertical beam is dropping in and out. So, 40 samples had to use the bottom track depth. Reference. The last category we have is a counter plus a warning. And so, this would be how many samples are affected and what the the warning is. So, uh, example in the bubble is uh, number three, three samples with bad bottom track. So the third sample has bad bottom track, and we've had three samples with bad bottom track. So you know that you haven't had any good uh, bottom track for the first three samples. Uh, Isaac, do you think that um, you know, if, there's, if, the, if the errors, or especially warnings, if, that, if there's a couple, but it's distributed well across the section. Would that, would that have the same impact on the measurement then where all the warnings are grouped in a specific area in the, in the transit? Yeah, that's a, that's a great uh, point of clarification. Um, if you have uh, intermittent warnings or, or errors that are dispersed, to say it's a very large section, you have over 200 samples and you have three, me three errors uh, or three warnings that, that you have uh, bad bottom tracking or three errors that you have magnetic error um, exceeds the threshold, that's probably not a problem. But if you have a grouping of 9, 10, 20 samples in a row all in a specific section, that's when you need to start considering how you're making the measurement and maybe if the site is good or not. Great point. 
Okay, so now here um, we're going to we're showing. <coughs> excuse me. Uh, now here we're showing uh, illustration that shows the the different parameters that we're checking with this QA QC utility. So we're checking the setup. So <coughs> excuse me. We're checking the setup. So it, it was your did. Did you enter the correct information when you set up your instrument uh, in the compass setup? So did you enter a magnetic declination? Um, parameters associated with the transect uh, communications. So are we getting all of our samples uh, via radio from the system? Or for some reason, have we had some radio dropout and are we missing some samples? Uh, GPS, how is the GPS quality? Is our GPS quality changing? Uh, edges, uh, it's very important to follow some, some guidelines when collecting edge data. So we have warnings that are associated with the edge data collection. And then finally, if you're testing for a moving bed and trying to correct for a moving bed, we have um, improved uh, feedback for the loop or the stationary moving bed analysis methods. So um, now that we've kind of given an overview, Daniel, can you walk us through what it looks like, what this QAQC window and, and feature looks like in River Surveyor 4.0? So what we've, we've done is made a slight modification to the actual layout of River Surveyor Live. Um, if you use your mouse and you click on the right on your sample uh, table uh, summary, uh, you will have the option to display uh, or enable or disable the QC window, which is located just below the panel, uh, the sample panel. The newest messages uh, or, or information that's supplied during the measurement will be placed at the top, and therefore all your previous messages will scroll to the bottom. Um, you have the ability to also use the cursor. Um, to scroll down if required, but I would suggest to uh, rather just focus on the latest information coming in. Um, and then the, the advantage of the system is everything is also available in post-processing. So the user has the option to view all the information in post-processing. Um, you can also filter information. So for example, if you only want to see right, how many warnings that I receive uh, for bad bottom tracking, for example. Um, you can right click on the window itself, on the QCO, QC window, and then you can disable the other warnings that is applicable. So you're only focusing on those couple of, of measurements. Uh, we also only supply the information that is based on how you configured the instrument in SmartPage or which uh, references you have used in post-processing. So for example, if you go to uh, in post-processing, and you reference, for example, the the, uh, the system to bottom tracking and maybe to the vertical beam for depth, we will only show you the messages applicable to those two because that will reduce and, 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 and focus the information more to what is applicable. And otherwise, you could end up with um, information that's not really, if you, especially if you start evaluating the measurement, that is not really applicable. Um, so that is the same with when you set up the instrument in SmartPage. So if you decide you're going to use a certain uh, a reference for, for, uh, for track reference or, or depth reference, we will supply you the information based on those references. And, and Daniel, is, can you talk a little bit about uh, what happens if you open up an older uh, a file created by an older version of the software with once you've installed 4.0 and how this is going to display? Um, all right, so if you're going to collect data with all the uh, instruments, this will not display. You basically will have to collect the data using the latest version, version 4.0, uh, for you to have the ability to see the information displayed. So what are the advantages and operational requirements for this application or feature? Um, First of all, and I think that's probably the most significant one, is you do have a real-time evaluation of your measurements against set standards and principles. Now, what did we use for those um, uh, standards and principles? Uh, we basically reviewed 
um, some of the key uh, some of the key organizational standards that's been implemented uh, by various organizations as well as ISO standards and made a combination of that and tried to implement that so in there would be cases where the evaluation would probably not be exact match of what you're currently using in your organization but at least it will give you indication so for example if your measurement time um, in most in the US is around 720 seconds uh, minimum I know these countries like Australia that's using 800 seconds so you know it's not exactly a match but at least you get an indication that you are approaching towards your your own requirements um, identify site conditions is probably another key aspect um, making sure that the site is suitable you know if you have significant vegetation on the bottom um, and you can't get proper bottom tracking it's going to affect your measurement so either you have two options either select a new site or in some cases you if you're able to do that clear the site bef and before you continue the measurement uh, measurement techniques uh, we will give you immediate response on if um, there was aspects of the measurement that impacting uh, the data quality, uh, boat speed for example, um, unnecessary acceleration of the boat during a measurement. Um, system performance is analyzed, you know, do we have some sufficient power supply, is there communication issues that can affect the measurement, and then user error, um, you know, and that would focus probably more on the, the smart page data that was captured, you know, have you uh, populated certain fields? Um, because that, you know, a lot of cases, that's the issue. You know, there was uh, either a misentry of the of the instrument there for draft, or there's no value entered, or magnetic declination. So we are running through that all of those type of aspects in life. Um, what is operational requirements? Um, it's something that you need to change in your operations, and that is to physically evaluate your 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 data that you're getting in, in real time because you're getting the information in real time. So you can make a decision on the fly if, if, if your measurement doesn't comply with the requirements. So train yourself in your operations. Focus on what is supplied because that will give you the indication of what's going on. And then that will assist you in a fairly short time to determine the impact on the quality of the measurement. Yeah, and so if, if I could uh, add something here. This, so what this really does is, is it's a time saver for the user. If you're using this feature, you can know right away um, within a few samples that maybe you need to change your transducer depth or um, that, or you need to go back and, and set one of the, the system settings before you take one transect, two or four transects, then sit down and review your, your data at the site and then decide, okay, well, I have to throw those away and either change something about the, my my setup or actually move sites, so it could be a significant time saver for, for the user. Yeah, especially nowadays where users are required to finalize the measurements in the field. So you, you, you need to quantify the measurements in the field before you leave for the next site. Okay, so now, now we're going to shift gears and we're going to talk about uh, River Surveyor stationary live and, and uh, an added feature where you can use, uh, if you have a GPS with your system, you can use this GPS, either DGPS or RTK, for the, the station position and then also the distance between stations. So Sontek has implemented uh, a method uh, to assist the users in performing stationary measurements using uh, a river surveyor system, and that is basically determining the position of the instrument at each station or vertical using GPS. Um, this is definitely, I think, one of the a unique features that would assist users in improving their uh, measurement process as well as uh, opening their scope of various sites. Um, it will definitely reduce and improve the accuracy, of, reduce the actual workload, but also improve the accuracy of the measurement. If we just want to review quickly the measurement process, the first step, and this is similar to with using a tape or tag line, you still have to determine the azimuth. Um, and the reason why, and you will see as we go through that the azimuth um, and velocity measurements are totally separate from the positional data. Um, 
So as of your normal uh, stationary measurement, um, the first step would be after completing your smart page form is to determine the azimuth at the site. And that is basically just to determine uh, a line perpendicular to the velocity direction. So you would place the instrument in the, in the, in the main uh, flow direction where the highest flows occur and then collect um, azimuth data or compass data to get a heading for the azimuth line. When the azimuth process is completed, the next step is then to get a GPS projection line. Uh, the purpose of the GPS projection line is to create or develop a datum that we can project all the GPS measurements to a single datum. Now you'll ask me, but why do you want to do that? Um, we can't just calculate the actual distance between each GPS coordinate because that's going to give you diagonal distances. It's not going to give you the three um, uh, perpendicular distance between each point. For example, if you are uh, doing a stationary measurement from a bridge and you let out line uh, maybe a couple of feet or a couple of meters additionally from one station of vertical to the next, we're going to calculate the diagonal distance between those two coordinates. So if we project those to a, a projection line or, or so the same datum, we resolve that issue. So the first step would be is to develop a projection line. Um, so the first point you do is if you open the software, you will get a get start location. And this start location should be the closest to your starting edge. So when you, um, you, you, you start collecting GPS data there, um, and we supply you GPS information, latitude, number of satellites, and also a counter. We don't limit you. Or, or, or indicate what time is required, but you can use the counter as an indicator. So every counter, one counter is one second. So around 30, 40 seconds would give you a very accurate uh, uh, position using GPS. The second point would be is to get the end location. And similar as with the start location, the, the boat should be at a certain location, and then you start collecting GPS data at that location. Uh, we highly suggest that if you're using a tag line and there's some slack in the in the tag line itself in the center that you would rather use your end location towards the opposite bank uh, because that end that slack in the in a tag line can create a skew projection line and that's not something that you want. So basically, Daniel, um, when you're making a measurement, you don't need to follow a straight line across exactly, but when you're creating your projection line, you want uh, more or less straight line perpendicular to flow. Is that correct? Yeah. yeah, that's correct. OK, so um, now we'll walk through the, the measurement process. So um, in, in essence, it's the same as it has been for uh, river surveyor stationary. Um, now you just have this option to use your GPS for the station position and your distance between stations. So to start to start your measurement, just like you would normally, you need um, your your start edge location. So previously, this had to be a, a location that was measured from the edge of the water, and you had to, had to give the location of the edge of the water. Now you have the option to measure it physically. Um, if that's possible. Um, if not, now you can have the option to place the system directly on the edge of water, so the M9 with the GPS directly above the edge. So the, the M9 won't be, M9 or S5 won't be in the water and collecting accurate velocity data, but this is just for the position of your edge, which is very essential if you're going to use this function for the edge location. Um, and then uh, one thing to note here is that at each station, you have the option to either enter a manual distance or use the GPS for reference. So for example, if you have tree cover on your edges and it's not possible to use GPS, you can enter your edge distances and maybe your distances between a few stations manually where it's possible to measure. And then um, when you get out into the channel and have good G GPS data, which you'll see in the, in the stationary dialog box, then you can switch over to using the GPS distance between stations. So once you get your edge, um, 
your edge location, either from GPS or a measurement, then um, you proceed with a, a stationary measurement as you would um, traditionally by going station by station across the section. Now, um, though, you have the you will see the live um, distance from the last station based on GPS, and and you can space your stations accordingly across across the section. Um, one thing to note is that this feedback when you're not actually measuring, when you're in between stations, is live, so it's one second GPS data. So it's going to fluctuate some, um, and it, it, it's more essential to get in the ballpark of your distance, your required distance between stations, than get in the exact, because the, the, the GPS distance between stations is going to be very accurate, and it's more that's more important than getting exactly two feet, three feet, one meter between stations. You're looking for a ballpark, and then when you hit measure, it's going to average that position for the whole time that you're making the measurement. I think I definitely agree with you that um, what we've seen during beta testing is that there's no need to really place the instrument at precise increments. Um, the GPS data that's coming in is raw; it does fluctuate. Um, so being, you know, within the ballpark is, is probably the best way to go. Um, we do, and as Isaac mentioned, we do collect that GPS data during the entire time you perform a velocity measurement. So, you know, if you're going to collect velocity over 40 seconds, we collect in GPS data also over 40 seconds. So that uh, instrument position is very accurate because of, of the additional averaging we do. Good point. Thank you, Daniel. Um, so this is uh, showing. Uh, an illustration of what, what it would look like when you're getting towards your end edge. And so you have, you, you've measured at stations all the way across the section and now you get to the end edge. And just like with the start edge, now you have options. So uh, if it's possible, you can measure, you can place the system directly on the edge of water and record the GPS location of that position. Or um, if it's more practical um, or, or necessary, you can also enter the distance. So in, in the software, there's this uh, use GPS checkbox next to um, the, the distance. And so when you want to use GPS, you have that checked. And when you want to enter it manually, you uncheck this box and enter in your manual distance. So the advantages and, and again, operational requirements for uh, the GPS stationary position, um, right, obviously, First of all, you don't need a tag line or tape uh, anymore, um, and that's a big feature. Uh, you know, especially at sites where it's difficult to make use of tag lines um, or using tapes. Um, we have incorporated uh, the use of, as Isaac previously mentioned, uh, the combination of you can either still continue using stationary, only using a tape or tag line, or only using GPS or a combination of it. So it, the software makes it very flexible for a user to uh, to adapt to the site conditions, as, if you can put it in that regard. Um, I think one key aspect and advantage of this is a true measurement location. You know, there's a, the assumption is made always, um, especially if you do it from a bridge, uh, that the instrument position is in line of your tape measure uh, increment, uh, which is not always the case. And, and, and as you may know, you know, if there's any wind conditions, uh, skew flow lines towards the site, your instrument is not going to be in line with your with your uh, with your tape increment. And the reason, and because we are measuring the GPS uh, position at the instrument itself, you are getting the actual two measurement location of the instrument, which is a huge advantage. Um, again, as I mentioned previously, and as Isaac also did. We do averaging of the GPS position, um, and that has a huge impact on the accuracy. Um, we've comparing the GPS versus RTK measurements, and we got very very similar results in California. Um, so it does that you know that averaging of 40 or 60 seconds, depending on how long your your, your velocity measurement time frame is, does improve the, the positional accuracy extremely. And site investigations, I think this opens River Surveyor for those users that's not only using River Surveyor for discharge measurements. You know, you can there's numerous applications that you can think of. You know, determining the velocity profile at hydraulic structures, at um, in, uh, intake towers, um, even in treatment plants. If you want to evaluate uh, the velocity around uh, a certain 
uh, inlet system. This is perfect for that because you can basically place the instrument there, the GPS coordinates, determine the position, and you're just collecting velocity data at that single point. Right? It's obviously, for those applications, you, you're not interested in the in the area and discharge calculation, obviously only in the velocity. Um, one other application would be sediment research and sediment sampling. You know, when when users are performing sediment samples, they uh, keep the boat stationary at a single uh, certain position. They're collecting um, data as uh, sediment samples, but they also can collect velocity data and a GPS position at that same point. So this is a, a huge feature that can add to to that process. Um, the operational requirements, um, as Isaac mentioned, edges. Um, if you want to base your water edge um, on GPS, then you will have to physically place the M9 on the water edge. Um, now, obviously, there is cases that that's not going to work. You know, if you have a vertical uh, bank, for example, if you have an artificial canal, that's going to be difficult. Um, so, in that case, you'd probably use a tape measure to to measure the first portion to get away from the edge and, and, and that influences on the GPS signal. Um, station location, as we previously mentioned, don't try to to, to place the, the instrument at the exact increment. Say, for example, you decide to make your stations um, or verticals every six feet or five feet. Um, I would suggest just get in within that approximation. Don't try to spend time to get that exact location. And uh, one more advantage that uh, wasn't mentioned on the slide, but is a significant advantage, is this this feature opens up sites that previously were only uh, moving boat measurements were possible. So with uh, a manned boat or maybe even a remote boat, you had to do a moving boat measurement because you didn't have a tagline or a cable way that you could ac accurately measure in between stations. Now it's possible to use this, this GPS feature to um, make a measurement using a moving boat um, or using a, a remote boat or a manned boat to do a stationary measurement. So if it's a challenging site for uh, moving bed conditions or some other reason and it's more suited to a stationary measurement, um, it's now possible. This opens up sites that were had to be moving boat previously but now can be a, a, a stationary stationary uh, is, is an option. Yeah, I agree fully and I, I always wanted to give this example and we haven't tested it but I, you know, it's maybe a, a question to the users is that, you know, nowadays with remote boats, most of them have ordinary features. So, you know, that would, I would love to see this type of application be applied with that feature with remote boats and that will definitely be interesting to see if that's possible. Okay, now, um, so this is our, our first example. Uh, this is from a, a, a Sontech customer who's been using moving boat and stationary for quite quite a few years in California. And uh, this is a site where they tested the, the GPS position, station position and distance between stations um, in California. So this is an overview showing the site and the, the pins are the actual station location. So the next, we'll zoom in a little bit. So this is a station. This is on a on an irrigation canal, and as you can see, the, the the pins are the actual GPS coordinates from the the stationary measurement. Uh, this this user is very excited because in the past it was maybe possible to do a stationary measurement at this site because it's a it's a cable way, but it was it was difficult. It was time consuming to to try and accurately measure in between stations. Now they could just run it, see the feedback on the distance between stations in the software, and, and quickly make a stationary measurement at a site that previously was not, not easy to make a stationary measurement. So this is just a, a close-up again of the same site, um, but this one shows actually three different uh, stationary measurements performed. Um, you will see there's a slight deviation in some of the, the stations, uh, positions, and the reason for that is is basically the slack in the cable. So during either wind influence or change in velocity, uh, the cable is basically moving up or downstream, but and that's the, the variation. But it does show a high level of consistency between the measurements. And um, we've definitely, you know, the, the table below just give us a summary that we have of two uh, measurements. Um, and there's definitely a 
significant uh, consistency, increase of consistency with using GPS over maybe a tape or a tagline. Okay, so now here, here's another example uh, beta test site. Uh, this one is located in Canada, and this measurement was done during an ADCP regatta. So um, there was many measurements made uh, at this location or near this location. And uh, again, this is on a canal. This is a kind of overview, and these are the actual GPS coordinates uh, of the stations used during the measurement. So here's a zoom in. Uh, showing in, in more detail, and, and you can see the sort of see the, the station spacing in between the different locations. And one thing to note here, you'll see upstream is a bridge, and so traditionally, maybe without this utility, uh, needing to lay down a, a, a tape measure to measure the distances between stations, uh, the, this measurement might have been made from the bridge. But uh, it should be noted that. Bridges are not always the ideal place to make a measurement from. Actually, can most of the time there there are a few bridges that are ideal, either because of magnetic interference or um, maybe more importantly for a stationary measurement, you have bridge pylons that are, are causing flow disturbances. So it wouldn't be an ideal site. With this GPS distance between station utility, you can now move away from the bridge and you're not tied to the bridge, even though it's not an ideal location, just because you need to lay down a tag, tag line. And Daniel, can you talk a little bit about the, the measurement results here that we're showing? All right, so this, this measurement was performed in, in Canada um, at a ID speed of got up. Uh, so the GPS or stationary measurement uh, was compared against, I think it was in the vicinity of 10, 12 uh, moving boat transects. So the value that you see there is the average of 10 to 12 uh, moving boat transects. And the results we got were, were very high. Although we did know that stationary does supply a very consistent result either way, even if it's tape or, or, or GPS. One thing that we did verify from this, and you know that's one aspect that can impact the operation is how does your GPS system operate in the area that you're working in? Um, so although we haven't tested this, this application throughout the world, uh, we have verified that extensively in, in the United States as well as in Canada. Um, and that just shows us that you, know, you are able to get sufficient accuracy of it off, uh, from GPS for stationaries in those two areas. Um, I have a question here, um, just someone maybe should answer. Has GPS stationary mode been used with a remote control boat? And the, the answer is no. Um, actually, the answer is yes. So we've, we've had uh, a user in the UK who, uh, sorry, Daniel, this is, uh, I, I talked to uh, one of our application engineers in the UK, and he actually tested the, the stationary method with a moving boat, or with a, a remote control boat, and was able to get very good results. Um, it's, it's important to note that it probably needs to be relatively homogeneous flow so that you can maintain your location with each station, but uh, it is possible. And as Daniel mentioned, um, with the, the improvements and, and uh, the technology for AutoNav and, and maintaining a position, uh, it's probably going to become an even more um, feasible option in the future. Right. Thank you for that answer. Well, this might be a question on top of that. Um, was AutoNav used in that process or not? No, no. All right. So that's maybe the next step. Is you know I would expect users to to start the in in that direction, and we will definitely on the other side as well is to see how AutoNav can handle this um, to make the, the operations a bit smoother. Okay. So now we'll um, go through the rest of the new features that have been and improvements that were added to River Surveyor Live 4.0 and River Surveyor Stationary Live 4.0? So River Surveyor Live had this existing feature where you can compress files um, in, a, in, in a zip file, um, but it didn't really answer all the requirements that users and basically ourselves at Sontek had for that purpose. So we decided to reevaluate the, the feature in, in as a whole. And, and develop it as a as a proper data management tool, if you if you if you want to use that term. I I think this is the uh, excellent 
tool for, for users to manage their data, and I would highly just recommend this for, for, for every single office. Um, the fact that you can generate a single file that can be shared by auditors or reviewers of the data, or even when you're archiving the data, is extremely valuable. Um, so there's a couple of requirements uh, to use the, the, the feature itself. Um, all the, the RIF files and the .RIF R files that you want to include in the .RS extension um, should be opened in the Rivers Away Live. Um, otherwise, we're not going to know which files you want to add to the zip file. So um, just make sure you, that you have all of the, the, the transects open. And if your requirement is to, to, to store your .RIF files as well, that um, maybe just you know for 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 background sake, .RIF R files are the files uh, stored on your, your your device, your laptop or tablet, and your .RIF file is stored on the M9, which you physically have to download manually afterwards. So if your requirement is to have both, make sure both is open in the Rivers of Live. We store everything that's open in the Rivers of Live in that .RS file. Um, if you're only going to use a certain couple of transects for the final discharge calculation, um, we will save that settings as well in the WSP file. So make sure that all your files that you want is open in the Nervous Survey Live file, and then all the text files and MATLAB files that you want to add to that should be in the same folder. So if you look at, for example, uh, your discharge summary or your velocity or SNR files, those should be located in the same folder where your data of R files are located. And we will zip everything in together, and it's basically just a zip file with a .rs extension. And, and uh, the reason for the .rs extension is now, um, this is a significant improvement on how this functioned in the past. Now you can compress all your files um, for, for one measurement from within River Surveyor Live, and now you can also open that that compressed file from within reverse repair live before you had to unzip and then go in and open the files. But now, now you you can select the .rs zip file, open it within reverse surveyor live, and see the settings as they were when the last person or you you finished post processing your data preserved exactly as it was with the same transect selected, um, the same track references. Everything is preserved uh, as it was when post-processing was finished. Another feature that we added to, to River Survey Live is uh, manual configuration. Um, and the, the direction we followed here was basically giving the user the ability to go and set what profiling mode or profiling method should be used, uh, frequency, a cell size, number of cells, and blanking distance. Currently, you can only set this for incoherence. Uh, profiling mode, false coherent is not available at this stage, and you have the option to select either between a 3 megahertz or 1 megahertz transducer, and then the cell sizes, number of cells and blanking distance associated with that. Um, each of those transducers have a minimum requirement, and the software will indicate it to you if your blanking distance or cell size are too small. I think this is definitely a useful tool for users for general operations as well as research. Uh, general operations, I would definitely still use Smart Pulse as the default measurement. Um, so before you play around with manual configuration, I would highly suggest just perform a normal measurement using Smart Pulse and then evaluate the data. If you feel that manual configuration would get a better result at that specific in, uh, uh, flow conditions, then you can go and state. But then at least you have two data sets to compare with and see which one will result, um, which result will, will give you the uh, best outcome. Um, with research, this is a, a, a very good tool to have because now you can force the instrument to measure fixed cell sizes, fixed distances, and this is a good thing to then start evaluating, especially if you look at sediment research or when people are trying to, to evaluate index velocity sites um, to see what is the velocity profile at certain conditions. And, and use that to determine some sort of a surrogate either velocity or, or, or suspended sediments. The function is available under the system page. Um, under the, the existing loop and SMBA method, there's a manual configuration function. 
Okay, so now um, the improvement we've made to the moving bed test, the, the loop method, so there, there are certain requirements that are, are, are recommendations to follow to collect a, a valid and good loop measurement. Uh, so if, if you have moving bed, this is one of the ways you can determine uh, and quantify your moving bed and correct for your moving bed. Uh, and there's the recommendation that you maintain a water speed that's relatively constant and uh, no more than one and a half times your water velocity. So now in, in, in the loop dialog box, you can see we, we plot the, the ratio of boat speed to water speed, and then we also plot the boat speed on this top graph that's indicated here. Um, and then the second very important thing to, to make sure that you uh, follow is that your loop duration is three minutes or longer. So now we've moved the duration onto the dialog box as well. These, these uh, parameters were available in the past, but they weren't front and center in the loop dialog box. They've now been moved into the loop um, box so that it's easier to um, watch these as you make your loop measurements, make sure you have a good uh, measurement. Yes, no, I agree with you definitely. This, this keeps all the information required to perform an accurate loop um, really available for the user. Okay, and, and one of the other in improvements is we've uh, we've had this automated MATLAB export. Uh, this has been improved, so now you have an option. You can go in and check automatic MATLAB export. So if you're uh, routinely using these MATLAB exports, as some users do for post-processing, uh, for research, or just as part of a standard operating procedure, you can automatically, um, you, you have a checkbox choose so that you just automatically generate. So this is just one less step for the user, saves the user time. Um, this automatic export is done at the end of a measurement. So when you complete a measurement, it exports a file. If you go in and do post-processing and then you apply a correction, it overwrites that file. Um, also, if you lock a measurement, it then rewrites a, a new MATLAB export. Um, so it's something to keep in mind is that it, and save you a step if you're routinely creating MATLAB exports of your, your data. Yeah, I would, I would also suggest, I think that, uh, um, you know, if you're not going to use MATLAB files, don't select the option because they are fairly large files and uh, it will definitely, uh, you know, impact your, your, your memory if you're going to store a lot of measurements. Um, this feature was definitely was developed for users that, that analyze the, the measurements in uh, using MATLAB software post-processing and the previous step basically required the user to close the reverse way live, reopen it, reopen all the measurements and then create an export. Now we've basically taken out the entire step um, improving the overall process and, and, and uh, speed of operations. In post-processing um, we've added a feature that you know, there's one requirement that's been coming for a while uh, to handle uh, spikes in velocity itself. Um, so for, for users that wants to uh, disable uh, a sample that has spikes in the velocity data, um, if you go to the samples tab and right click on the top header banner um, off, off the table, you can add a function debug, debug use. And that will supply you a whole, uh, basically, tick boxes in that specific column. So if you untick that specific box for that sample, then that sample's data won't be used in the processing, in the discharge calculation. And what the software will do is it will average between the previous and the next sample. Um, so that's to get rid of, you know, specific cases where you have spikes in the velocity, either bottom tracking or water velocity data that you can get rid of. Um, so that's a, a unique feature as well. Yeah, this is a, a powerful tool if you have, say, uh, GPS multi multipath where you have a velocity spike because um, you're getting uh, bad GPS data near an edge and say it only happens for one or two or three samples, you can deselect these samples and, and uh, you no longer have the velocity spike that's then being applied to your total discharge. Um, so it can help correct for minor um, problems like this. If you have major problems, this is not a solution. Um, and, and one thing to keep in, in mind is that 
the, the actual raw data file is not changed at all, so it's, it's preserved. Um, and uh, you, when, if this file is, is zipped as a .rs, uh, the, if somebody's going in to review the data, they can see that certain samples were deselected um, because of velocity spikes or for whatever reason. Okay, and with that, uh, that, that concludes our presentation. So now we'll uh, take any questions. Uh, if you have questions, please submit them via the chat feature. In, in the GoToWebinar, and uh, Daniel and I will answer questions for about the next 10 minutes. And again, if you have questions and we don't get to them, uh, we apologize, but we will follow up with an email that includes all the questions that are submitted and our answers to them. So a question that we have here is stationary GPS. Um, if I wish to have a number of stations 0.5 meters apart, how do I know exactly where it should be? Should I start from GPS coordinates to position my sensor, vice versa? Um, so basically what the software does is either if you use, if you use GPS as you're starting uh, as your reference and you place the M9 on the water edge, um, we will collect GPS data from that point. So if you move the, the instrument, we will show in the dialog box in the window um, how far the instrument is moving from that previous location. So we will basically tell you that GPS is moving. Um, if you're using a tape measure, uh, we will only collect GPS data at the next vertical because the first one will be based on tape measure. So you can do a combination of um, either way. Um, but we will have to collect GPS data first before we can indicate to you how far the, the system is traveling. Just one thing to take into account is that if you move the boat from one station to the next, it takes a while for the boat to get into place, obviously. Um, so allow a couple of seconds just for the boat to, to basically, if you want to use the term swing, swing into place um, where it should be. And there should be slight movement back and forth um, as the water velocity and, 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 and the flow conditions impact on a, on a boat itself. Uh, but yeah, we give a, basically for your indication of how far the boat is traveling in the software. Thank you, Daniel. Um, so the next question we have here is why use stationary method over moving boat method advantages of each? So uh, the stationary method is a very uh, good method to use if you know you have uh, moving bed conditions uh, or a challenging site. Uh, maybe the, if, if you have pulsing, so you may not have the most stable conditions. Stationary, uh, you're averaging velocity data over a set amount of time at each station, and this can help modulate some pulsing, or, and, and also you need to keep the, the boat more or less stationary so you don't have to apply a moving bed correction. And so this, these can be advantages. If you have a hard time uh, with, with bottom tracking and or GPS at a station uh, or at a, at a site for moving boat, then stationary is, is a possibility. Um, if it's problem with GPS and obviously you'll need to measure the distances between stations, but if it's with bottom tracking, then stationary with GPS could be a, a very good uh, solution. Yeah, maybe it's just something to add on that I think is that, you know, if you, if you compare the two, just look at the variables that's applicable or the, the, the information that's applicable to moving boat versus stationary. Um, you know, if you use a moving boat, um, you probably are going to need an accurate compass calibration, uh, accurate GPS. Uh, need to perform a moving bed test, uh, where stationary you can start to exclude some of those variables because that doesn't impact stationary as much as with moving boat. Uh, so both both have advantages. Um, I won't definitely won't say the one is better than the other option because I think one of the one of the requirements is is, is, is your site requirements, um, and that and that you can't dictate by any method. Um, you know, some users doesn't have the luxury of bridges um, or cable systems. Um, some area doesn't have good quality GPS. So it all depends on site requirements and what you can use to get, what you can select to get the best data set out of it. Yeah, and, and so one, one other point to bring up with that is uh, moving boat measurement uh, is possible at, at almost any site where you can get a boat into the water or, or a float into the water and, and move it from one bank to the other. And if you can't maintain positions at stations, uh, because it's a man boat and swift velocities, then moving boat is 
you're probably going to be your best solution because you don't need to uh, maintain a position for a set amount of time. And if that's not possible, then moving vote is the option to go to. Um, yep. So another question we have here is, have you experienced any magnetic interference in GPS collections? So I, I make the assumption this is applicable to stationary. Um, so there's, there's two key differences between stationary GPS and moving boat. Um, with stationary, the GPS operation and implementation is totally separate from the M9s of the river surveyor compass or the velocity measurements. So the, the developing the projection line, determining the positioning of the station is totally separate. It's almost like if you can think of using an Android GPS at each station and import that data into the software. It's almost similar to that. Um, we don't use so any impact on the compass uh, magnetically wise uh, won't affect and doesn't have any impact on the station measurement positions. Um, that's why you also don't add the magnetic declination in the station software because the two is not linked. Uh, in the case of moving boat, that's a total different story. So we are using GPS either as, as, a, as a tracking reference or bottom tracking as a tracking reference. And if you use GPS as a tracking reference, then you must have a very accurate compass calibration. You must have magnetic declination. And you need to know if there's any magnetic influences during the measure. Thank you, Daniel. Um, so we got a couple questions on this one. Uh, will will the new software require a firmware upgrade and uh, firmware needed for uh, River Surveyor 4.0? The the short answer is no. All of the changes um, that have been made are in the software. Uh, with that said, we always recommend that you have the most up to date firmware with the the, the most up to date software. Um, if it's prohibitive uh, with for your agency requirements, it is possible to use older firmware with the new software. Um, and just keep in mind that if it's much, much older firmware, there may be some some problems. But if it's relatively recent firmware, you don't need to upgrade your firmware in order to use uh, River Surveyor or Stationary 4.0 because all of these changes that have been implemented are on the software side. And Isaac, maybe I'm not sure if you mentioned it, but the latest firmware is 4.0. O2, so we highly recommend that you do upgrade to the latest firmware. Okay, um, and then here's another question to do with uh, sort of data quality um, uh, telemetry. So why do I get lots of transects with mi missing samples with uh, PCM2 when this never happened with PCM1? So. As some of you may know, we have uh, different generations of PCMs. So we had an original PCM1, and now uh, the, the system, the power and communication module we sell is a PCM2. So this is actually um, was a, an issue with uh, data, data handling between the, the system and the computer. And this has been improved with uh, uh, the, the code in the newer software. So data is handled better. So if you have the most up-to-date software and up-to-date firmware, then you, you should see this, this problem go away for PCM2. All right, so that's all the time we have for today. Um, we still have other questions that came in, but uh, like I mentioned earlier, we will uh, send a follow-up email within the next week um, that includes all the questions from the webinar and our answers to those. So with that, uh, Thank you very much for joining us today, and um, I hope this was a, a useful presentation. And uh, stay tuned for for emails on on future webinars. Yes, Isaac. Yeah, thank you very much for attending. And the, uh, if you have any questions, feel free to contact either myself or Isaac or, or our tech support, and we will be uh, happy to support you in that regard.